Thanks for joining us for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We are very happy to have Thorsten Slock with us from Apollo. Hi, Thorsten. Hello, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Thorsten was actually the first speaker when we started this webinar series in March 2020. And he will talk today about US fiscal policy and the long term interest rate, term spreads, and many other things. So we will try to look at the US Treasury market in more detail today. So if you look at the government debt levels here more generally, historically, looking back in advanced economies, that's the blue line here. So it's, it's going up. You see it's very, very high compared to historical standards, even after the Second World War and the First World War. You know, it, only after the Second World War, the levels were a little bit higher. If you look at the emerging economies, the yellow line, it's also at almost record levels. So we have essentially already now very, very high debt to GDP ratios. And if you go further beyond, if you go into projections of the Congressional Budget Office, you will see even more increases in the debt levels across many, many countries, or most countries, advanced and emerging economies. Now, the other thing you have essentially is that you, the US Treasury has to roll over next year about $9 trillion worth of government debt. So a lot of this debt is very short term and has to be rolled over. And then the question arises, you know, if you can't auction off this new debt in a smooth fashion, will it be the case that actually then the central bank steps in to buy some of the T-bills or treasuries in treasury auctions? And essentially you end up into some form of monetary financing. And to what extent can you guarantee the central bank independence if the central bank is nudged, let's call it nudged, to, to buy and step in and help out in selling off uh, these treasuries? So that's one of the challenges we want to talk today about. Of course, when you talk about US treasuries, you talk about safe assets. So a safe asset is you know, an asset which is like a good friend. It's around when you need it, and it's liquid when you need it, and it actually appreciates in bad times. And how can you create an extra demand of safe asset? If there's extra demand for safe asset, then actually means that for the US Treasury, the interest rate is going down. And one way to create extra demand for safe asset is to create more uncertainty. So if you have a very erratic policy, there will be a lot of uncertainty there that creates more demand for safe asset. Another way to create an asset, extra demand is just to have some form of financial repression. You force the financial sector to hold some US treasuries or only other government bonds. So that's another way of creating some extra demand. And by doing so, you bring the interest rate on the US treasury down. Of course, if you create too much uncertainty about the US Treasury, you might lose or at least get a scratch on the safe asset status for the US Treasury. And then you, you hurt the exorbitant privilege the United States has. And of course, whether you lose the safe asset status or get a scratch is always a relative statement. So how sound is your uh, situation relative to other countries? And if all other countries get in higher and higher debt, it's very difficult to run into some other safe assets. So the safety is actually a relative statement and it's often referred to as the least ugly horse theory. You only have to be uh, less ugly than the most ugly horse in terms of your debt level doesn't have to be higher than uh, the other alternatives. So it's always relative to other alternatives. The other thing one has to be worried about if the US Treasury is actually the bone, everything is built on the US Treasury in the financial system. If something goes wrong with the US Treasury, it has repercussions not only for the US Treasury, but also for the whole financial system because a lot of trading activities is based on US Treasuries. And on, not only for the US markets, but for the whole global financial architecture. So that has repercussions as well. So we have to think it's really a global common good uh, that you have preserved the US Treasury as a functioning market extremely well. So with this few remarks, I would like to go to Torsten's poll questions, uh, which you answered very nicely. And I thank you for that. Uh, the first question is, is the US fiscal policy on a sustainable or unsustainable path? And 76% thought it's an unsustainable path. Only 24% thought it's on a sustainable path. So more than three-fourths thought it's on an unsustainable path. Second question was, what will be the first signs be if the US fiscal unsustainability is really, when, where will it show? Will it be by US sovereign downgrade rating agencies creating down the US Treasury, that 16%? Will it be their weakness in treasury auction metrics? So if something going wrong on US treasury auctions, 42%, that's actually the biggest uh, portion. There will be high term premium, 
or it will be a weaker dollar, only 8% thought. So the maturity thought, the weakness in the treasury auctions, some failed auctions in US treasuries, uh, and higher term premium. The third question was, will the US experience a debt crisis? That's only 22% thought. A gradual orderly rise in the long-term interest rate, 66% thought, or it will have no impact on the financial markets because the US dollar is essentially the world currency, and that's what 12% thought. So two-thirds actually thought there will be a gradual orderly increase in the long-term interest rate. And the fourth question was, will they step in with new QE measures if there is a gradual rise of, of a, uh, when the interest rate rises because of fiscal unsustainability? And 58% thought, yes, the Fed will step in, so almost 60%. And 42% thought, no, the Fed will not step in. So Fed will, you know, don't want to do any monetary financing. So with this, you can actually, as I said always, you will provide you with a summary. There will be a link down uh, in the YouTube channel uh, where you can actually get the executive summary of today's presentation, also with timestamps and everything. And uh, please click on this if you want to you know, get the executive summary first or afterwards. Again, thanks a lot to Thorsten for leading us and guiding us through your treasury market today. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Markus, and thanks so much uh, for having me. <clears throat> so as Markus mentioned, uh, there are a lot of different things and a lot of different aspects of uh, US fiscal policy that you can look at. And what I was thinking about when first we talked about putting this presentation together was to try to get some structure for how to think about what are the challenges, uh, of course, not only on the fiscal front, but also what are the challenges for people in financial markets in terms of how do we think about what does the U.S. fiscal situation mean? And unfortunately, there is no easy way to put down in one model. And then this is the answer to the question, what will happen when fiscal policy becomes unsustainable? So instead, the presentation is organized into the four different areas, which were also the four different areas or four different areas that was in the second question that uh, we just looked at in the poll. First, I'll take a look at the very, very broad question of fundamentals for the US fiscal outlook. All those things go into ultimately a decision by the rating agencies. Are there reasons to downgrade US government debt? Are there reasons to not downgrade US government debt? What are the different parameters that become important when you think about what is the level of debt? What is the level of deficits? What is the level of spending on interest payments relative to federal outlays on other things that the government spends money on? And all these different aspects, this is the biggest part of the presentation, basically is a walk around and looking at various different dimensions of what does it mean when we talk about whether US fiscal policy is sustainable? What are the different dimensions in terms of interest payments, in terms of debt levels and deficits, and so on? Secondly, we will turn to a closer look at treasury auctions. Namely, when you do a treasury auction, you get a number of metrics that come out of the auction. For example, as we'll see, you get metrics for the bid to cover ratio, meaning how much money was being bid on government debt relative to how much was being offered by the government. There's also metrics for did the auction outcome, did it tail? In other words, was it the case that the yield level outcome of the auction was higher than where we were in the when issued market? Those different dimensions tell us something about whether we are moving towards more weakness in treasury auctions, meaning weakness in terms of demand, or whether treasury auctions still are steady and strong. Then we'll turn to a closer look at the term premium. Uh, as we all know, the term premium is a measure of what is investors' willingness to buy long-duration government bonds. In other words, what is the premium that people need to get paid to buy long-duration relative to if you constructed a trade that was basically done with one year, one year forwards and rolled over for the next 10 years, where you would simply have the opportunity of opting out of the trade so if you have to stick to holding on to duration, what premium do people want to have in markets? And we'll look at that because if the term premium was moving up, that's another way of saying that interest rates are moving up in the long end. 
for visas that have nothing to do with Fed expectations, but have something to do with other reasons. And one, of course, reason could be the fiscal sustainability. So the term premium is a very important concept for figuring out what is the appetite for investors for buying long long data government bonds. And finally, we will also take a look, of course, at the dollar and the US as a reserve currency. This is a very important point, of course, as we also just had in the poll, namely a discussion around what are the characteristics of a reserve currency? Are there under any scenarios where we can imagine that the US might no longer be the world's reserve currency? And that discussion, of course, also becomes important for the rest of the world's appetite for buying US assets, including US treasuries. So in short, just summarizing, how could the unsustainable fiscal path that the US is on, and I should say importantly, that's not a controversial statement anymore. Jay Powell, whenever he's asked about fiscal policy, the main thing he emphasizes is that the trajectory that US fiscal policy is on looks unsustainable. So now for the question, of course, for financial market becomes, well, how could this show up? How could we suddenly see any evidence that we are on this unsustainable path? And when could it potentially begin to matter? And of course, the number one thing is, if we do get a US sovereign downgrade, that could happen without any warning. Remember the rating agencies downgrade things uh, and upgrade things every day. Uh, and that is not something where you get noticed that a downgrade is coming. It literally just comes out with a statement. And of course, that could potentially be something that could play a role. Treasury auctions, again, weakness could appear without any warning because treasury auctions happen throughout the week. Think about it, the US auctions off on a running basis, three-year notes, five-year notes, 10-year notes, 30-year government bonds. And of course, these auctions, the metrics come out at 1 p.m. normally on weekdays when the auctions are running. And then the market is told, was there a strong auction or a weak auction? So again, without any notice, this could just appear literally out of the blue. The term premium is a little bit more slow moving. There are various models that at least often are referenced in financial markets. There's one by Jens Christensen at the San Francisco Fed. And there's also, of course, the one by Tobias Tobias Adrian, who was at the New York Fed, which you can get on your Bloomberg screen. And those measures of what the term premium is doing often get some good attention in terms of what is going on with investors' willingness to buy long-dated government debt. And finally, of course, the dollar. So far, the dollar has been going up. That's a separate discussion what the dollar has been doing here more recently. But broadly speaking, of course, if the economy starts to slow down and if the red Fed were to lower interest rates, that could, of course, put downward pressure on the dollar. And that could begin then to open some of this discussion about, well, what is the rest of the world's willingness to buy U.S. assets if suddenly the dollar begins to decline? So the bottom line is, so far, so good. We do not predict that we will have any problems with selling U.S. treasuries in the very the foreseeable future and potentially for a very long time. But nevertheless, we have, of course, seen in history that because of these four different areas, that there could be, of course, scenarios where we would need to spend some time on understanding, well, what is the strength of treasury auctions? What is going on with the term premium? What is the likelihood we'll get a sovereign downgrade? And of course, also importantly, what is the outlook for the dollar? So that's why our conclusion is, which is the main message in the presentation, it is unlikely that we'll get a debt crisis. There is a sub-question, as Marcus also was mentioning, namely that if yields do go up, will the Fed do QE? And it was interesting to see that in the poll, 60% was saying that yes, the Fed would do QE, because obviously both the ECB and the Federal Reserve have, when they have intervened in long-term bond markets, they have constantly repeated that we're doing this to stabilize the financial system and in the European language, to support the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And it is, of course, constantly argued that this is not done for political reasons. So that's why the question here becomes whether that will happen or not. And that continues to be a very important point also for thinking about what the implications would be if we did were to see interest rates go up in the long end. So that's why I happen to agree with the polls that more likely is a gradually higher long interest rate and a steepening of the yield curve on the back of that we might have scenarios where yes everything can still continue to be orderly and that's what i think should be the baseline but we may still have that even if things are orderly that you could begin to see interest rates still move higher and therefore the term premium moving higher and therefore ultimately in the current environment with the fed cutting interest rates a steepening of the yield curve so with that as the agenda let's first look at number one namely what are the fundamentals for the u.s fiscal situation 
And the first chart and the most important one in this entire discussion is this one here from the Congressional Budget Office. This is the CBO's estimate of where will debt to GDP go over the coming decades. Today, in round numbers, debt to GDP is about 100%. And you can see the projection is that it will go to 200%. So when people say that fiscal policy is unsustainable, this is the chart that people are talking about. And I should also note that this chart here is a chart that has looked like this, uh, unfortunately, for quite some time, for many years now. And of course, the Trump administration now coming in is, of course, raising a lot of discussion around what will the Green Line do? Will the Green Line go up more? Will it go down? That all remains to be seen. But where we're sitting right now, it's clear that the starting point is obviously that U.S. fiscal policy is on an unsustainable path. Importantly, for the calculation of how unsustainable is the situation, it is, of course, critical to remember that the Congressional Budget Office needs to make an assumption about 10-year rates, which is the green line, and they need to make an assumption of what you see in the blue line, namely the average rate paid on federal debt. And of course, these assumptions, as you can see, go all the way out to 2054, become very, very important for what the steepness is of the mountain that we have ahead of us. So if I just go back to the previous page, if you assume that interest rates are going to be in 10-year rates, say 4%, but they actually turn out to be 5%, obviously this will have consequences because then your debt payments and your debt servicing costs will be higher. So that's why it's important to note that even the green line there for how much the problems will continue here over the next years continues to be very important, driven also by some underlying assumptions done by the CBO, most importantly around what is the level of interest rates. And as we know too well, just in terms of what's going on in markets at the moment, long-term interest rates since late September have really started moving higher. They actually started moving higher literally the day of the Fed meeting when the Fed cut rates with 50 basis points. And we have since then seen long-term interest rates go up by 100 basis points. So this, of course, has resulted in quite some uh, discussion around, well, normally when the central bank lowers interest rates, you would expect that long-term interest rates also go down. So why is it that long-term interest rates are not going down while the Fed is cutting? Instead, long-term interest rates are going higher. And part of that, as we'll see in a minute, has to do with the term premium getting higher and steepening. And that's, of course, a very important part also of this debate, that if we are now entering an environment where the CBO assumptions are wrong, then, of course, the simulations that you saw from the CBO will also turn out to be wrong. Another way of looking at the situation that's more simple is just to look at the budget deficit as a percent of GDP, the OMB. They calculate, of course, uh, the, and quantify their estimates of what we will see over the next 10 years. And their federal budget projection, as you can see, is in very round numbers that the budget deficit will continue to be 5% again over the next 10 years. And again, this is before we know what Trump might or might not do on the fiscal front. Another dimension of thinking about uh, the, uh, the uh, composition of government finances is to take a look at, okay, so in the pie chart to the left, how much of government spending goes towards debt servicing cost. And that's what you see in the gray little area there where I have put in the arrow. Namely, as we speak, for every $100 that we all pay in taxes and the government goes out and spends, 13% of that goes towards debt servicing costs. And if you now look to the right sources of financing, then you, of course you can see that the sources of financing that goes and comes from borrowing is now 28%. So that means that of all the spending that the government does, 28% of that comes now from borrowing. So you already have some numbers. We'll look at these numbers in different ways in a minute again, but you already have some numbers that are pretty significant in terms of the role of the deficit playing in particular here coming from what our net interest servicing, uh, debt servicing costs looking like. Another way of looking at this is to look at the Congressional Budget Office forecast for what will the percentage of total outlays, meaning government spending, what would that percentage, which today is 13% in the pie chart to the left, what would that look like over the next 30 years in the pie chart to the right? And you could quickly see that under the assumptions that we looked at earlier, if debt levels are higher, and of course deficits continue, and at the same time, assumptions about 10-year interest rates at around 4%, you will see, not surprisingly, that an even bigger share of government spending will go towards net interest payments, namely 
So that also means that over time, if we go under unchanged policies, we will continue to see, of course, more spending go towards debt servicing. And finally, just looking at non-interest outlays and thinking about, okay, so if a growing share of spending goes towards paying interest, what is the distribution of other types of spending by the government? And you can see in the orange area here that total non-interest outlays, meaning spending that the government does on everything else that is interest. You can see major healthcare programs are playing an important role in the orange area. In the light blue, you can see that Social Security is playing a bigger role today. And look at where this is in 30 years. Well, healthcare will play an even bigger role than it does today, as Social Security will play an even bigger role. So that means that what is called mandatory spending, which is the orange and the light blue, will continue to get a bigger and bigger share of overall spending for the government. And that's what you see in this chart here. This chart here splits government spending into mandatory spending, which is the dark blue line. Mandatory spending basically means the spending that we do on Medicaid and we do on uh, and Medicare and on, of course, also Social Security. And the light blue line is the discretionary spending, meaning the spending that we do on everything else than what is mandatory. And you can see that discretionary spending in, to the left used to be 70% of federal spending, and today is now down to 30%. So that means that when we begin discussions around where can we cut down government spending, or for that matter, where can we raise taxes, but in this situation, where can we cut down government spending, it is simply the case that a bigger and bigger and bigger share of government spending is now social security in particular. And that becomes very important because that means that if you want to get the fiscal situation on a more sustainable path, then the challenge is, can that be done simply by tweaking discretionary spending? Or is there a way to do that without moving mandatory spending, again, moving Medicare and uh, Social Security spending? And that's, of course, the political debate that becomes very important around what decisions need to be made to get fiscal policy back on track. Can I ask you two questions? One of is, course. Um, of course, the term premium also depends very much on the expected growth rate. So if the term premium could also go up because people expect a higher economic growth rate, which would be a good thing after all, and also brings the debt to GDP ratio down. So that's, you know, just to play the positive card. Another positive element would be we saw in the last five years or even 10 years that the health expenditures we can somehow bring under control. So if, we, if there's a big initiative, essentially, to bring the health expenditures under control, that might be, you know, two measures which, which would help in this regard. Absolutely. So there are certainly a lot of things that can be done. And also, if you don't want to do this overnight, but you want to change the cost of living adjustments, meaning what is the basically the inflation that goes into what are entitlements in nominal terms, that could also be something that at least over time could be making a difference in terms of if you adjust these things gradually. And certainly to your point, healthcare costs could also be, if they were changed in any shape and form to be lower, would certainly also be helpful. And, and to your point about the term premium, that is correct. The term premium is driven by a lot of different things. So that by it does become an interpretation in terms of what does it tell us what the term premium is doing. The key issue and the reason why I put some weight on the fiscal situation potentially playing a role is that the term premium has moved quite dramatically since basically the middle of September until today. So this was partly before Trump got elected and it was also reflecting that maybe there were some worries about that at least on the different scorings, both by the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, by the Penn Warden Budget Model, also the Tax Foundation, both Harris and Trump implied more fiscal deficits are coming. And it seemed like investors were waking up at least to more that conversation in financial markets was about the fiscal deficit and the fiscal situation playing a role. But you're right, we just don't know. And it's hard to run regressions with the term premium on the left-hand side and find out exactly what the significant variables are that explain what the term premium is doing. In this context of this chart here, just important also to note that the primary budget deficit in the US is currently around 6%, so this is for 2023, and compare that with all other countries, also telling you that the US stands out on the fiscal front simply by having a bigger deficit than everyone else. Let's now turn to the maturity structure of government debt, and you spoke also about that in the beginning here, Marcus, but this turns out to also be very important when we think about what is the maturity structure? In other words, how much debt needs to be rolled over? How much debt is floating rate? How much debt is fixed rate? 
And this chart here, which comes from the Federal Reserve, uh, basically is one way of looking at how can we split out US government debt on the different subcomponents. And first of all, marketable debt is 98% of total outstanding. And of that, 9% is variable interest rate and 89% is fixed rate. And if you then split that out again on what type of government bonds are outstanding, you can see that the biggest part is notes. Of course, notes means government bonds that are, of course, two-year notes, three-year notes, normally five, seven, and 10-year notes. So those are, of course, the vast majority. We'll see also that also later. The vast majority of government debt outstanding is in what could be basically, of course, in, in the usual language characterized as the belly of the yield curve. You still have long-dated bonds. So that means a 30-year and also still have 20-year bonds. That's about 17%. And as we also will talk about here later is, of course, that a significant and a growing part of debt outstanding has been in T-bills. So this is just to give, like, if you look at a corporate capital structure, this is just to give some very broad overview of what is the distribution of how does the government decide to finance itself? What is floating rate? What's ver what is the fixed rate? And also, of course, where on the yield curve does the government decide to issue? The reason why this is important is because we now, of course, all in financial markets spend a lot of time thinking about how much government debt has to be rolled over. And the Treasury calculates, and this is where the data here comes from, uh, the data for how much government debt will mature over the next year. And the green line shows you what is market interest bearing public debt that matures within a year or less. And that is on the left axis. And that number is, and I know these numbers are a little bit hard to digest, but that's about $9 trillion. So if you now do that, instead, I look at the percentage of marketable debt uh, maturing in the next 12 months. So this is now as a percentage of all debt outstanding. That's now 33%. So think about this from a market perspective. If we had that, say, 90% of all debt outstanding was maturing in the next year, then it would perhaps be a problem getting that refinanced. If it was like 10%, then, of course, it would be much easier. But here we are now up to a third of government debt outstanding that is maturing in the next year. And finally, a last final way to calculate this is to basically look at it relative to GDP. So market interest bearing public debt maturing within a year or less as a share of GDP. And that is now roughly at 30% or 31%. And why is that the case? Because debt to GDP, remember, is 100% of GDP. So that means, of course, these two numbers are not too far away from each other. But this opens up, of course, a lot of conversations around, okay, so where on the yield curve is it that the U.S. government and the U.S. Treasury has decided to issue a lot of paper. And this picture here shows you treasury issuance across the yield curve. So this is showing you, for example, for five-year notes, auction sizes in 2024 went up by 57% relative to 2023. And we just got the numbers for 2025, and you can see that they are staying very elevated. The first thing to observe in this chart here is that it looks like the orange bars are higher to the left and they are lower to the right. So why doesn't the Treasury just go out and say, you know what, we would like to issue a lot of 30-year government bonds. Why don't they just say, at the moment, as you know, and as you can see in the chart, annual issuance of 30-year government bonds is roughly around 300 billion. Why don't they just say, why don't we just issue a trillion and get it over with? There's a good lot of bonds issued in the long end, and then we can lock in interest rates at that level for the next 30 years. Well, the challenge with that is that who is the buyer of 30-year government bonds? And the main buyer of 30-year government bonds is pension funds, and to some degree also insurance companies, but mainly pension funds. Why are pension funds buying 30-year government bonds? Because pension funds have some members who they owe some liabilities over the next 30 years. And therefore, if you have an asset that has a lifetime of 30 years, you can pay the cash flow from that asset to pay off your members of your pension fund. So that's why pension funds, they get $100 in inflow every month, and they turn around, and they take some of that and use that to buy US treasuries that are 30 year long day government bonds with the idea that they have matched their assets and liabilities and therefore are a significant buyer of duration. But because the inflows into pension funds only grow very slowly and they probably only grow with GDP, that means that demand for duration only grows very, very gradually. So that means that if the treasury came out and said, we would like to dramatically increase the amount of 30 year government bonds we would like to sell, you would have a mismatch in those auctions between the supply of treasuries, a 30-year bonds you want to sell, relative to what is the demand for those 30-year government bonds. And of course, if you have a mismatch, you run the risk 
that that auction would begin to reflect much higher levels of interest rates simply with the fear that there will not be enough demand for 30-year government bonds relative to the increase in supply. So this is another way of saying that the Treasury is deliberately and thinking a lot together with the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee about where on the curve should we issue. And as you can see, the orange numbers here are telling you that issue and so far has gone up and has gone up a lot more more recently in the front end and here meaning the belly of the yield curve. Uh, Torsten can ask you another two questions. So one is, um, of course, you through financial regulation, you can actually induce pension funds and insurance companies to buy more of the long dated bonds uh, through financial repression. Uh, that's one way to increase the Correct. demand for the long dated bonds. And the other thing is it could be that the, the numbers in 2018 put on the short end are depressed because the Fed did QE and the Fed was buying a lot of long dated stuff. And hence, you know, the, the US Treasury was issuing a lot of long dated bonds in 2018 and, and so forth. And that's why the increase is not so dramatic because now the Fed is doing QT and essentially it's going in the opposite direction. All correct. And as, it's not only the budget deficit that's increasing supply of treasuries, it's also QT that's increasing the supply of treasuries. And also, as we'll see in a minute, the amount of T-bills outstanding has grown so much. So that may also increase more supply of treasuries further up the yield curve. And you're right, the bars here are certainly a function of whether the Fed does QE or QT. But you do look at the level of interest rates today, which obviously is quite dramatically higher than what they were in 2018 and before the uh, the, uh, before COVID came along. So mm -hmm. the fact that rates are moving up and the fact, of course, that the fiscal situation continues to be a topic of conversation is also at least maybe a very important uh, talking point, at least things we should think about when we think about what interest rates will do going forward, other than the usual discussion about what the business cycle will be doing. Another way of looking at this in terms of issuance and in terms of how much supply of treasuries is coming to the market is to look at gross issuance of treasuries and just in very simple words, it's gone up a lot. And we now have a three month sum that we sell in gross numbers, including T-bills, roughly 7 trillion. So that's of course also again, asking the question, who are the buyers, which we'll come to in a minute, who are the buyers of treasuries and what would that uh, demand look like under different scenarios? In particular, of course, uh, the different scenarios as a function of where on the curve issuance is going up. You, you can divide that number. About, with uh, when they roll over the existing expiring or maturing T-bills, are the new buyers the same as the old owners of the old T-bills? That is normally, the, so we don't know the answers to that question because we just know what the auctions are saying. But the answer is that's, my best guess is that that is the case. So that's why on the margin you may have, and let's just, so let's just anticipate the Fed is going to continue to cut interest rates. Well, if money market funds have attracted a lot of money because interest rates were high, we now have mm -hmm. six and a half trillion money market funds because of interest rates going up. Well, if the Fed is going to cut, then you do, to your question, begin to wonder, will households still be putting money into money market funds, uh, money market accounts if the interest rate that they get in the money market account starts to come down, in particular, come down more dramatically? The risk is, therefore, they may not be the same people who will be buying T-bills because people may then begin to take their money elsewhere. And that's, of course, why when you have a big stock of T-bills, the big question is that the demand from the money market fund community becomes hugely a function of how many inflows they get, which will be hugely a function of where the Fed sets interest rates. And if do you, if you divide- who, who holds yeah. the T-bills and who holds the long dated? So, you know, the foreigners might hold more long dated bonds and uh, the money market funds T-bills. Is there, do you have a chart of that? Like yeah, so the, so the T-bills are mainly held domestically and long dated bonds, uh, is, as we'll talk about in the ownership part, is roughly in very round numbers, 25% of uh, government bonds are held by foreigners and they mainly hold the longer end. Mm -hmm. So just to get to those points, if you divide total issuance with GDP, you get that quarterly treasury gross issuance as a share of GDP is also now more elevated. So purely from a rollover and issuance perspective, the trend has been going higher. And that's of course also again, part of this debate about how much higher can this go and will there continue to be the demand of, uh, for, for treasuries. One important aspect that we already have touched a little bit is this issue that T-bill issuance has been a very significant part of overall issuance. And you see that in particular when you look at T-bill issuance and you think about where that is today and compare that with where T-bill issuance has been historically. There's been this uh, debate, as you and I have talked a lot about also, Marcos, here in the last uh, six months where there's been a discussion around, well, why has T-bill issuance gone up so much? Normally, 
as you can see in this chart here, T bill issuance goes up a lot when there's a recession. Because when there's a recession, the Fed lowers interest rates to zero and there is a financing need and when interest rates are zero, it, it, not always zero, but more recently zero, of course, that means that the government goes out and issues in the front end and therefore T-bill issuance starts to go up. But the discussion recently has been, well, why is it that we've had so much T-bill issuance more recently when interest rates have not been zero? We have not been in a recession and nevertheless, over the last five, six quarters, T-bill issuance has really gone up dramatically. And that's why T-bills now, as a share of all debt outstanding, has grown. It's not at the levels we were at during the financial crisis, during recessions, T-bill issuance always goes up. But it's gone up to a level where the snowball, if you will, of T-bills that we have in front of us that needs to be rolled over is now up to $2.2 trillion. Remember, T-bills are characterized by having four, eight, 12 week or very short duration and short maturities. So if that's the case, the question now becomes, if we have a fairly significant stock of T-bills in front of us. Well, that does mean that if that needs eventually to be turned around and therefore issued as longer dated debt, that means that we will get more notes and, and, and more coupons more generally, where we will see more issuance further up the yield curve as the stock of T-bills will be eventually rolled over into other maturities. And of course, the ultimate consequence of issuing shorter and shorter dated paper is of course that we have seen a decline in the average maturity of U.S. Treasuries outstanding, so this is the uh, uh, what's of course normally called the WAM, the weighted average maturity of debt outstanding. And as you can see, it's still at six years, so nothing to worry about. Everything is still fine, but it certainly has been coming down from the levels we were at here just a few years ago. Again, as a reflection of issuance being more in the front end of the yield curve. And as you already mentioned, and we talked about, Marcus, also here, the Fed is at the same time doing QT. And the Fed is running down the balance sheet, that's also adding more supply of treasuries to the market. Taking just a quick look at debt servicing costs, this gets a little bit back to some of the numbers we looked at earlier. The bar you're seeing here is the interest payments, and interest payments at the moment make up 13% of total government spending. It's projected to continue to be high. If you now take net interest payments on debt here, in this case, as a share of GDP on the right axis, and this is net interest payments in dollars. Of course, if you have still high levels of government debt and you still have elevated interest rates, of course, the debt servicing costs will also just continue to move higher. Of course, that is under the very important assumption we spoke about earlier about what is assumed about what 10-year rates will do. And if 10-year rates are now going up, so the orange line here shows you the six months forward for 10-year rates, and the green line shows you total interest expense as a percentage of public debt outstanding. And you can see, if anything, this chart here points to that maybe we're going to see even more upside pressure on interest expenses over the next several quarters as a result of the level of interest rates being higher. And as you can see, this is of course also a risk in the near term that maybe interest expenses will continue to be quite so, so elevated. Thorsten, uh, Laura asked the question, shouldn't we focus more on the real interest rates? So if it's purely inflation, uh, then it will inflate the existing debt stock away and, uh, and a high nominal interest rate, if if inflation goes up with it, it might not be so dramatic from That's a correct. sustainability perspective. It, it happens to be the case that the Fed has a nominal inflation target of 2%. So one way certainly to, to fix the problem we had in this, so let's just go back to this very first chart here. One, one way to fix this problem we have in this chart here is certainly to just create a lot of inflation. That has been done, uh, I worked at the IMF for many years and many emerging markets have gone down that road of just trying to create a lot of inflation, not intentionally, but the inflation had the the, the consequence that it would be um, eroding and basically uh, uh, deflating away the debt levels. But the problem with that is when you have a central bank like the Fed that has to have inflation at 2%, so if inflation goes up too much beyond that, then the Fed will step in and say, no, we can't allow that to happen. So because we have a nominal inflation target, that is then, un unfortunately for this uh, uh, way of solving the problem, is no easy way and it's not possible to create all that inflation, unless, of course, the Fed changes their inflation target or changes their goal to something else than the dual mandate. But that's not what I or anyone else would expect at this point. So therefore, I do understand that there's a difference between real and nominal rates. But given that the inflation target is two, then we should probably assume that, therefore, looking at it in both non-real terms should probably not be too different, at least from these perspectives. And, and just for the, next, the, the next question is essentially yeah, whether, you know, the Fed independence might be under threat or might be under the Fed might be under pressure to help out on this. So the, the, the broad theme in this discussion, of course, is fiscal dominance, namely that if your debt levels go up so much that 
it ultimately begins to limit what the Fed can do in terms of raising interest rates, then of course it will have the consequence that if interest rates are raised by the Fed and if debt levels are so high that debt servicing costs will rise dramatically. This is basically a version we have of that in Japan. Then uh, you could certainly have a situation where you begin to think about, well, what is then the role of the central bank? What is the role of the Fed in scenarios where debt levels are so elevated? So I do not think that the Fed independence will change. And I think the Fed will continue to have the dual mandate. So from that perspective, I still think that uh, we should be looking at everything we're talking about here on the fiscal front uh, separately from uh, assuming that the institutional framework is going to change in the U.S. And the other way of calculating debt here is, of course, to look at net interest expenses per day on public debt. So this is a very simple number, and this includes Saturday and Sunday. It used to be the case, as you can see, that the green line was basically that we were paying $1 billion in net interest payments per day before the pandemic. But after the pandemic, and of course, now both debt levels have gone up and interest rates have gone up, now we're paying $3 billion every day. So that's another way of saying that we should, of course, expect that when interest rates stay higher for longer and debt levels continue to go up, that therefore debt servicing costs continue to go up. And the last point in this discussion is, let's not forget that when you raise interest rates, it also gets a very important positive effect on the economy because money market fund dividends, which is what you see in the green line, have gone up quite a lot. In other words, think about money market funds when interest rates were zero. You would literally get zero or close to zero in return. Now you get close to 5% in return. So that's, of course, something that if you take total money market fund dividends on the left scale, which is roughly $500 billion on an annual basis, that turns out to be roughly 2.5% of consumer spending. So that's another way of saying when you raise interest rates, people who own money market funds, people who own fixed income, of course, are going to get a cash flow. And that's, of course, going to support the economy. So that's why higher rates, yes, our traditional New Keynesian model would say that that's negative for demand and therefore negative for the economy. But there is this important positive small effect, smaller than the negative effect, namely that it does help those who hold the government debt and those who hold the T-bills. So let's now turn to what you asked about, Marcos, namely, who is but it? That, that assumes there's no inflation change. No? If, if interest rate goes up and inflation goes up, it, it doesn't help. That's correct. Yeah. So inflation was 9% in 2022. Now it's come down to 2.5. So it has come down. And certainly there was a huge erosion of purchasing power for consumers when inflation was 9. But now it's come down. That means that in real terms, consumers now have more purchasing power than they had before. But you're right. Again, the difference between now and real becomes very important. The, the difficulty about that discussion, of course, is that there are some important aspects of this in terms of what we've just been through with inflation being 9 and now coming down close to the Fed's target at 2 again. So let's look at who are the holders of U.S. Treasuries. There are various different ways, and I'm going to show you various different slides in terms of who are the buyers of U.S. Treasuries and who is it that's been buying Treasuries in the last few years, in particular as interest rates began to go up. The first observation here is that we have about 25 trillion outstanding. And as you can see here, the split is relatively uh, uneven in the sense that uh, the biggest holder here is, of course, foreigners. And foreigners hold a fairly significant share. Mutual funds hold also a decent share. And we, of course, also have the Fed still holding, despite that they're running down their balance sheet, a decent share. Another way of looking at this is to focus on foreign holdings. Why is that important? Because foreigners used to be a very important buyer of U.S. Treasuries. This chart here shows you foreign holdings of Treasuries as a share of all Treasuries outstanding. And it used to be the case, as we also will see in a minute, that China was a big buyer of U.S. Treasuries. Why was China buying treasuries? Well, China was buying treasuries because they wanted to make sure that the exchange rate didn't go up too much. If the RMB appreciated too much, that meant that my shirt and my sweatshirt would become too expensive. And if that becomes too expensive, that means that they will be losing a competitive edge on their exports. So what they were doing for a long, long time is that they were selling RMB to try to limit the appreciation of the RMB, and they were buying dollars. Now they have the opposite problem because now the RMB has been depreciating. So now they are doing the opposite. Now they're buying RMB and they're selling dollars. So that means that foreigners and their purchases of US treasuries have gone down. And what's most important about this is that China was doing this to make shirts for me cheap and make toys, ties, everything you buy that comes from China cheap. In other words, they did this to manage their exchange rate. So they were not yield sensitive. They never really cared about what was the level of yield on US treasuries. So we have shifted from a yield insensitive buyer of treasuries to instead now a yield sensitive buyer. 
And that yield sensitive buyer, of course, is as we've talked about households, and it is real money, meaning pension and insurance. When the Fed started raising interest rates, households started plowing a lot of money into money market funds, and households started buying a lot more government bonds than they had done before because households like higher yields. Likewise, pension funds like higher yields, insurance companies like higher yields. So that's why you also saw real money investors come in and buy longer data government bonds and buy treasuries because the yield levels went up so much. So in other words, the challenge that we are seeing at the moment is that we have moved away from a yield insensitive buyer to instead a yield sensitive buyer. And why is that important? Because now we need to look at who are these foreigners that are buying US treasuries. It used to be the case, as you also can see in this chart here, if you go way back, that the main buyer, and this chart shows you net foreign purchases of US treasuries, and the main buyer used to be official purchases and also the private sector. But after COVID and more recently, the by far biggest buyer of US treasuries is private investors abroad. So foreigners now have a bigger gap between what are official, meaning central banks and sovereign wealth funds doing, which are still basically close to zero in their purchases of treasuries. Whereas you have on the private side, purchases have been much, much stronger. And why is that the case? Because private investors abroad also like to have higher yields the way you're seeing it in the US. And that's most best explained, of course, with the difference between Japan and China. And you can see China, as I mentioned before, this is measured in billions of dollars, have been lowering their holdings of treasuries, whereas Japan have been steady in terms, and Japan is now the biggest foreign holder of US treasuries in very round numbers at roughly around 1.2 trillion in ownership. And this is remarkable because this has been, despite that the cost for Japanese investors in terms of hedging have been very expensive. This is, if you look, for example, at the dark blue line, this is yen hedged 10-year treasury yield minus the 10-year JGB yields. So that means that in hedged terms, Japanese investors in the dark blue line are actually still getting a negative return which of course has uh, everything to do with the difference between the shape of the yield curve in the US relative to the shape of the yield curve in Japan. And that's why a lot of Japanese investors probably buy US treasuries without hedging. Because now, of course, the yen has been going down. And of course, at the same time, you also have uh, that yields have been a lot higher in the US than in Japan. And still, despite that the hedge difference here being negative, we've still seen Japan continue to buy more and keep up the level of treasuries that they have had now for quite some time. Okay. I just, Thorsten, yeah. um, John Kitchen has a question concerning how does, you know, the new tariffs on goods coming out of China, to, how does this interact with the demand for treasury? Yes, so- The in, Chinese try to weaken its currency further in order to offset part of the uh, uh, tariffs or, or what do, or do they just have less revenue coming from the US, hence they have to invest less than the United States. So how do you see that interaction? There? Absolutely. So a very important part of that debate is that what we saw in uh, the process and the period when tariffs came on China last time was that China's exchange rate began to depreciate. So in other words, in very plain English, if the price of things that are purchased in China goes up by 60%, then in theory, you should see maybe that the response could be that China could depreciate the exchange rate by 60% and that would exactly neutralize the tariffs. So that's why what happens to the Chinese exchange rate becomes very, very important in response to what is the level of tariffs that they're going to be facing. So that's why the FX issue in terms of what would the Chinese response be and what can they do and how far can they depreciate the exchange rate if they want to do that in terms of uh, trying to counter exactly what might be coming if tariffs are going to go up by 60 to 60% on universal, on everything imported from China. So that's why that's one tool moving your exchange rate in response to trying to neutralize the effect of tariffs. Another issue, of course, is that if we do see products in the US imported from China go up by 60%, okay, in that case, we will probably see a decline in imports from China. And the consequence of that is that China will get even fewer dollars that they can recycle so that may also run the risk that China could begin to lower their holdings of dollars even further because they will no longer have dollars that they need to convert into RMBs. So also the flows, the money flows that comes along with exports could be a very important consequence for U.S. rates if we no longer have China, even with the flows they have today, buying U.S. treasuries. So it could come under at least that theoretical scenario with the consequence that if tariffs come in, 
that it could begin to have some implications that there could be some, at least in theory, upward pressure on long-term interest rates in the U.S. But the first channel would work the other way, no? It's in a sense Chinese trying to weaken their own currency. They have to buy more U.S. dollars and hence might buy more U.S. treasuries. It, it all depends on how they do it. If they lower their domestic interest rates or if they do it through intervention. So you're right. It it, it could. Yes. There's a lot of moving parts in this discussion that also makes it difficult to disentangle what the consequences exactly would be for uh, U.S. interest rates. But it, it is right. Normally, what they have done, of course, is in different forms of lowering your domestic interest rates, say, in for example, Chinese interest rates going down to lower levels. And of course, the consequence of that would also then be putting some downward pressure on your own currency. But given that there are some capital controls and all kinds of issues around this, this also becomes something that uh, is, is, is quite difficult to, to find out what the, what the ramifications would be, because it would depend on exactly on what policy levers that they pull on here. There's one more question about you know, are the Japanese, do they buy the treasuries hedged? i.e. they you know, go to some foreign exchange derivatives? Or do we know whether that's unhatched, their positions, the Japanese? So we don't know that. Normally, fixed income is actually almost always hatched. But what is still so puzzling about the Japanese situation is that we have seen very strong demand still from Japan. So in that sense, uh, one, one way of looking at it is that probably some of this is indeed purchases that are done unhatched. We just don't know. There are some surveys, but they're not particularly reliable done by private banks in terms of how much is hedged and how much is not hedged. The vast majority is normally hedged, but it would be tempting if you are a Japanese holder of U.S. treasuries to do this on an unhedged basis. If you think that yen will continue to depreciate and Bank of Japan is not going to raise interest rates and at the same time rates are higher for longer in the U.S. This chart here shows you across countries the difference in ownership structure in the U.S. relative to other countries. The orange bar shows you what is the share of government debt in different countries that's held by foreign official holders. So, of course, foreign official for Greece means the ECB. And if you go over here and look at U.S., you will, of course, see that foreign official is relatively low compared to others. And instead, you see that a significant chunk of U.S. treasuries are held by domestic investors. So that's why a significant change in, of course, the ownership structure and the appetite for different parts of investors for selling and buying will become very important. When you think about, again, the elasticity, if you will, or the sensitivity to what is the willingness to hold government debt and why is it that you're buying government debt. And the more of your government debt that's held domestically, because interest rates are high in the U.S., the more yield-sensitive buyers you have, of course, the more vulnerable you get if yields, in particular, if the Fed begins to lower interest rates. The do domestic non-banks includes money market funds? Yes, that's correct. So let's now turn to the second part. So this was the first part of the discussion, namely the downgrade. And I didn't even talk about the downgrade probability here, but mainly talked about it from a very broad general perspective in terms of what is the overall situation from a fiscal perspective. So let's now turn and briefly look at some of the treasury auction metrics. And the goal with this, of course, is to try to figure out, are there signs of weakness in treasury auctions at the moment? And the answer is no. So let's look at it in different ways that you can look at it when you get the metrics that come out of the auctions. This is auction sizes across the yield curve. And you can see that auction sizes, for example, at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, for five-year notes is roughly around 60 billion, and also the two-year notes and three-year notes here around 50 billion. So pretty significant issuance in the front end of the yield curve, as I spoke about earlier. Turning now to the bid-to-cover ratio. Remember the bid-to-cover ratio measures what was the number in very plain English of bits? In other words, how many were willing to buy U.S. treasuries relative to how much was being offered by the government? And of course, the fear would be if the bid to cover ratio begins to go down. So looking at the bid to cover ratio for two, three, five and seven year notes, you can see that the bid to cover ratio is still looking generally good. It's been getting a little bit of attention that the light blue line for five year notes has been moving down. But broadly speaking, there's still sufficient demand relative to how much is being offered. So that's another way of saying that while auction sizes have been going up, you have still seen that the amount of money that was bidding to buy it, meaning buy the, 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 the treasuries at auctions, has also been going up. So in that sense, no drama on this front here. At this point, still treasury auction metrics still looking relatively stable. Same thing for 10, 20, and 30-year paper. You can see also same thing relatively stable. Again, 
if you take the magnifying glass out here, you could spend some time occasionally, you get some downtrends where people begin to say, hey, this is quite a move relative to the previous auctions. But broadly speaking, things are still hanging together quite nicely. Another way of looking at the, at the, the treasury auctions is to look at indirect bidding. Indirect bidding is normally foreigners. We don't quite know, but that's normally foreign participation. And that's been stable for one and two year paper. That's been stable for five and seven year papers. Surprisingly, here more recently, a little move up that people are willing to buy a bit more duration because yield levels are higher. And finally, for 10, 20 and 30 year paper, again, relatively stable. So really no signs, at least when it comes to these metrics, that things are beginning to deteriorate. And finally, as you know, when you have a treasury auction, the process, the way it works is that first there is a when issued market. In other words, the treasury announces we're going to have an auction in 10 days. And when that happens, there is a when issue market where you see a price trading up and down as a function of basically price discovery, a way to try to find out what will be the yield on that auction. And then when the auction suddenly happens, then at 1 p.m. on those days, you will see exactly where did the auction come in and what was the level of yields in the when issued market. And when the level of yield in the when issue market is lower than where the auction ended up, then, of course, that's what's called a tail. And a tail is a problem because a tail is, of course, telling you that there may not be enough demand relative to what the market thought literally seconds before. So that's why if, a, if an auction is tailing, it's telling you something about that maybe there was less demand than what people thought literally seconds before the auction result came out. And you can see that tails have, which is the positive numbers, generally been relatively well behaved. So this is looking at different types of auctions. This is three-year auctions five-year auctions, seven-year auctions, and 10-year auctions. It's been getting a little bit of attention that there have been tails that were a little bit bigger throughout the post-pandemic period here. But again, really no drama when it comes to the outcome of the auctions. You still have relatively strong demand. 30-year auctions have been a little bit more evenly distributed. But again, some tails, in particular November last year, got a lot of attention where people say, whoa, there was much, much, not much demand for 30-year government bonds. And that did result in, of course, long government bonds selling off, meaning long term interest rates going up because people took that as a sign that there was not that strong demand relative to what they had expected. But more recently, as you can see, 30 year auctions have been relatively well behaved. So, again, telling you that at least so far, so good, things are still looking fine. Finally, there are also a few other metrics, and I will very briefly mention this. But remember, you can have a situation where there is a primary dealer failure to deliver situation. And that's, of course, for a variety of reasons. Dealers may be unable to meet the obligations. And therefore, it could be, for example, if there's some short selling and they're not able to cover their positions. This is really not anything that has much economics in it, but only really just a measure of trying to figure out, well, are there some signs of distress in the, um, in the treasury market? And as you can see, we've had a little bit of a bump more recently, but really no major big deal. And finally, Another way of figuring out if there's distress in treasury markets is to look at where are yields trading relative to a simple uh, cubic spline fitting of the yield curve. And you have also seen a little bit more that some of the off the runs have been trading uh, quite far away from where you would expect them to be. And there are some very special reasons for that, but that's again also, you can see it's coming down more recently. That's normally interpreted as how much liquidity is there in the market, but you can broadly see that this has also been relatively well behaved. What's about the argument that in the U.S. Treasury market liquidity is actually lower? Market making capital devoted to market making or capital devoted to what's market making is much lower compared to the outstanding number of U.S. Treasuries these days. That's correct. That's why we have seen the emergence in the last five, ten years of high frequency traders that have come in and played a much bigger role. I have high frequency trader is someone who, very broadly speaking, is willing and able to trade at relatively small uh, denominations, meaning relatively small uh, amounts. In other words, you can offer 5 million, maybe up to 10 million. And then if markets are all functioning, it looks like there's a lot of liquidity. But what we, of course, have seen in a number of situations is that if suddenly there's a lot of volatility, then popularly speaking, the computers are turned off and suddenly those high frequency traders are no longer willing to trade. And then you are left with, of course, the more traditional primary dealers who are then, of course, the ones who have to make markets and therefore become much more in a volatile situation simply because those who normally provide liquidity have, again, quote unquote, turned the computers off. So that's why, yes, it's true that some of the market making has been shifting away from the primary dealers or the Wall Street banks towards the high frequency traders. But that has given more liquidity, but it has opened up this important discussion around 
well, when is that liquidity present, and can you calculate, and can you can you can you rely on that this uh, liquidity will always be there, no matter how much turbulence you see? There's also another question. If you look at the auction metrics in other countries, is it becoming more severe or less well run? The auction. Yeah, this is Europe very important. Or... So, of course, in previous episodes, so go back in the more recent extreme case, of course, was Greece in 2012. Uh, you have had episodes where countries have had auctions that were running well, auctions that were running well, auctions that were running well, and suddenly auctions were not running very well. So this is the whole challenge with this entire discussion that we are having today, namely that things can look quiet and, and all look good and everything is uh, steady and rosy and it doesn't look like there are any problems. And then suddenly out of the blue, uh, markets can change their minds and say, wow, gee, this auction was tailing dramatically. And therefore, suddenly you can change their view. People can change their views and say, now I no longer believe that this is the asset that I thought it was yesterday. And that's, of course, the risk. Uh, this is the speculative bottle literature Peter Garber and others have looked so much at, namely, when do you suddenly get these certain changes in how people look at things? And that is exactly what you've seen in other countries, namely, that you saw that everything was fine until they suddenly no longer were fine. I would not expect that to be the case. Again, I do think the U.S. is special in so many ways. But I do think that it is correct that we have had a number of countries where you have seen auction metrics be a lot weaker. And the U.S. continues to look good, so this becomes important. The auction process, so the U.S. has a Dutch auction process for treasury auctions. Other countries have other processes, but the conclusion is that treasury auction metrics turn out to be a very important place to look when you think about what is the demand for your government debt. I know we are beginning to run out of time here, so let me just very briefly touch on a few more issues. And of course, the term premium, we already touched on this. And as I mentioned, since the Fed uh, cut interest rates on the 16th of September, we've seen the term premium go up. In the longer history of the term premium, yes, it's gone up, but it's still way, way lower than where it was 10, 20 years ago. So that's why this has opened up a debate about are there any structural reasons why we should expect to have US term premium lower today than where they were over here. Uh, and that's a very important discussion, but uh, from a market perspective, what just is clear today is that the term premium going up is indeed something that gets a lot of attention. I do want to just before we end, end with a, just one comparison with Italy before we talk about the US as a reserve currency, because Italy happens to have fiscal fundamentals that are quite similar to the US. The dark blue line here is the fiscal deficit in Italy, and the green line is the fiscal deficit in the US, and you can see the US has a bigger fiscal deficit than Italy. Here, this chart shows you debt levels in Italy in the blue line, and the green line shows you debt levels in the US. Okay, so Italy has a little bit more debt than what we have in the US, and it's converging out here in the forecast period. And finally, this is net interest payments in Italy in the green line relative to net interest payments in the US. Net interest payments in Italy are now lower as a share of GDP than they are in the US. And why is this important? Because Italy is rated triple B, and the US is rated triple A, so this is raising a lot of questions about, OK, so if countries can have fiscal situations that are not too different, but still have different credit ratings, that does begin to open up a debate around, OK, so the US is certainly special, uh, but what does special then mean? And what are the implications of but, being special? The, the growth rate is also very different, no? and also demographic developments. There's a lot of other things that are different, and there's also the politics are different. So this is just asking the question, what is it that you put weight on when you do your ratings? And you could begin to talk about U.S. domestic politics. You can certainly talk about whether the U.S. growth rate will continue to be as high as it is. The potential growth rate, according to the CBO, is 2%. In Italy, it's just below 1%. So, yeah, there are some differences. But you're right. It is just to say that the debate around why are some countries rated what they are is exactly because in the U.S. case, we are, we are certainly special in the sense that, of course, the AAA rating comes on the back of being a reserve currency. And we all know very well what the reasons are why the U.S. is a reserve currency. But one very important issue that has become critical more recently is that sanctions have begun to play a role when you think about demand for U.S. dollars. You have seen especially the change in demand for dollars relative to demand for gold. We've seen gold as a percentage of reserves go up. And we've seen, which was, was the line I had earlier, foreign ownership of U.S. Treasuries go down. So that's why when you impose sanctions and you suddenly say to countries, Russia, others, that there's a limit to what you can do in U.S. dollars, if those countries then start to lower their holdings of dollars, that, of course, means that, therefore, they need to have reserves in something else. And that's why 
likely one important reason why gold prices have been going up is because of sanctions and shifting away from dollars as a reserve to gold being a reserve. That doesn't mean under any scenario, in my view, in our lifetime, we, at least during my lifetime, Marcus, that we will see the U.S. reserve currency status go away. But it does open up a lot of questions so if you about... if to do this chart in dollar terms, uh, you know, then the foreign holdings of dollars probably went down much more dramatically than the additional dollar value of gold. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me end with just one very final point, and this is what I was trying to link earlier, namely what's going on in money market funds and the Fed, and then I'll get to the conclusion. This chart here shows you what we debated a little bit earlier, namely that when the Fed started raising interest rates, what happened was that a lot of people put money into money market funds. So money market fund assets started going up, and they literally went up by $2 trillion from $4.5 trillion to $6.5 trillion when the Fed started hiking. Now the Fed is cutting. And we can debate, and we all debate a lot. How much will they cut? Will it be a little? Will it be a lot? But it's very clear that one very important reason why a lot of money went into buy T bills was because the Fed was raising interest rates. So this is now opening up a new debate about okay, if the Fed cuts interest rates, just take down to their own estimate of R star, which in normal terms is around three. What will people do with their money in money market funds? Are they going to keep it? That could be. Or it could be that they will say, well, you know what? Now I get not too much in T-bills. So why don't I just take my money and buy investment grade credit or private credit or some other spread product, mortgages, consumer ABS, something that gives me a higher yield. And if that's the case, then you suddenly have that central bank policy, meaning lowering interest rates, will begin to have implications for demand for T-bills. So that's why the T-bill issuance that we looked at earlier and the significant amount of T-bills outstanding can certainly become an issue if we do begin to see the Fed cut interest rates dramatically in the front end of the curve. So that's why the link between what fiscal policy is doing and what the Fed is doing suddenly becomes a bit more complex, simply because if the Fed starts cutting rates, it may mean that people take money, the six and a half trillion you see here, out of their money market funds, and therefore there's less demand for T-bills and begins to create challenges that T-bills are going to trade wider. So that's basically another way of saying that Fed policy and fiscal policy are basically entering a slightly more complex environment where you have that the Fed is cutting rates and at the same time, the stock of T-bills is as significant as it but, is. But the Fed tries to shift the portfolio, the portfolio into the more risky investments to stimulate the economy, I guess. That's right, but the government, that, con correct, but the government continues to issue a lot of T-bills and the stock of T-bills continues to be big. So if the government has a financing need, that may then interfere exactly with that goal as you're highlighting. Yeah. So just to summarize, and this is just the same page that I had in the beginning, U.S. fiscal policy is an unsustainable path. How could this become an issue? We spend time thinking about a downgrade. We spend time thinking about auctions. We spend time thinking about the term premium. And finally, we also spend time thinking about the dollar. The conclusion is, importantly again, so far so good. I do not anticipate a debt crisis. And I do not anticipate that this will be anything like we've seen in any emerging market. But I do think that the consequence is that we should be still continue to expect that there will be some more upward pressure on long-term interest rates as this issue continues to be important. Thanks a lot, uh, Thorsten. Let me conclude with one question. So you ruling out or find it unlikely that we have a list trust uh, in moment what we, compared to what we had in the UK, where suddenly the yields are spiking? Or uh, how would, Why would you say US is special besides the reserve currency and being the safe asset provider for the global financial architecture? So I do think that uh, what we're discussing here is not whether the US will pay back its debt. But I think what we're discussing is what price are we clearing at? Yeah. And that's another way of saying in, 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 in the simplest world, the risk-free asset is page one in your finance textbook. But if you grow the size of the risk-free asset, it will, by definition, that stock will begin to suck dollars out of risky assets because the money has to come from somewhere. So that's why at this trust moment or any moment where you see the politicians continuously growing the size of treasuries outstanding, it will eventually begin to demand so much dollars, either from abroad or from domestic investors, that it might begin to take dollars away from other asset classes. So that's why I think the most likely scenario is still that we will see if issuance continues to be as significant for the next several years, we'll continue to see more upward pressure as this issue continues to get more and more attention in financial markets. Again, I think it will be orderly. I think it will be gradual. Uh, and of course, we don't know with the new administration what policies are coming, whether we'll get fiscal consolidation or more spending. So we'll have to wait and see on that front. But it is clear that the market's attention to these issues, including the four things that are listed, 
uh, continues to grow uh, basically uh, every week and every month as we go forward, as we still continue to have this trajectory of fiscal policy. So typically we end it at a positive note, but <laughs> your whole talk was more on the positive side, alerting the dangers, but then saying, are we still fine? How would you... How would you characterize or give us a positive ending? At the end? I think that the positive ending is that the U.S., the most dynamic economy in the world, uh, the U.S. is the world's largest capital market. The U.S. has the Magnificent Seven. The U.S. is the innovator of AI. And the U.S. is therefore, the, in many ways, the envy of the rest of the world. And we are seeing a lot of dollars come in to the U.S. economy to invest in companies, to invest in securities, to invest in my world in private equity and private credit, to overall invest in assets because the view is that you get a higher return in the U.S. than you do in the rest of the world. So the positive note is that financing the U.S. government deficit will probably continue to be possible, not least because foreigners across the board are still finding the U.S. the most dynamic and, uh, and, and, and the highest return economy in the world that gives you higher growth rates, higher returns, and at the same time, of course, also uh, uh, where you see the biggest increases in asset prices. But that's, of course, a significant issue to debate whether will this continue. For now, it looks like this will continue. But if we do get a recession, if we do get a slowdown, if we do get a lot of different shocks can happen. And in that situation, the high levels of debt will just make us more vulnerable. And you would argue that you know, your strategy will remain the flight to safety currency, especially when the world becomes more erratic. That actually benefits the US Treasury. I will agree with that. And, and in, in your words, uh, a safe asset is a good friend. And I do think that the US Treasury will continue to be a good friend and a safe asset because the alternatives, uh, Chinese RMB in the euro area, unfortunately, China is facing three problems from demographics, uh, disinflation in the housing market, and now also engaged in a trade war, both for the US and Europe. And Europe has a number of challenges also, in particular, the slowdown in China is a problem for Germany. And you also have the energy transition is a challenge. And now with the recent political developments, you also have less strong leadership in Europe in terms of direction. All those things are idiosyncratic headwinds to the European outlook. So the fact that the US business cycle is so strong and the business cycle in the rest of the world is relatively weak continues to support still uh, US treasuries and US financial markets. Okay, let's not take things for granted. The safe asset status probably has to be preserved. And uh, hopefully, fiscal policy will adjust in a way to allow the US to continue to enjoy the exorbitant privilege. Thanks, again, thanks a lot. And I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for participating and uh, asking all these questions, many questions during our presentation. And I see you then next week again. Uh, we have a few seminars now coming up concerning artificial intelligence from different art AI from different angles. Thanks. See you. Cheers. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks. Thanks.